This unit is about matter. What is matter? Well, it's anything with mass and volume. What is mass? What is volume? Mass is how much matter an object has. So these terms are related. Matter and mass go together. Matter is measured in grams, as we've already discussed, and mass is not equal to, or it's not the same thing as, weight. So mass is not weight, weight is not mass. Weight relies on gravity, which we'll talk about more later in the year, but a way to remember that is that weight has a G in it and so does gravity. So weight relies on gravity, but mass does not. Volume is how much space an object takes up. For liquids, we measure this in liters. For solids, we measure this in cubic meters. Or, as we've discussed before, one milliliter is equal to one cubic centimeter. So, matter is classified into different areas, or it's split up into different areas. So, matter, any piece of matter, is either a pure substance or it's a mixture. From there, I get even more specific. So a pure substance is either an element or a compound. A mixture is either heterogeneous or homogeneous. Heterogeneous mixtures can be suspensions or colloids. Homogeneous mixtures can be colloids also or solutions. A specific example of a solution is called an alloy. So to go into more depth, our pure substances are going to be any matter that always has the exact same composition. So it's always going to be a certain number of protons, a certain number of neutrons, a certain number of electrons. Or it's going to be certain elements combined in the same ratio all the time. So a fixed composition means that it doesn't change. And a uniform composition means that no matter how big or how small that pure substance is, the composition is always the same throughout that substance. The two types of pure substances are elements and compounds. Elements are just known as the simplest substance that we can have. It's what we have on our periodic table. They are only made of one type of atom. And to remind you, an atom is the smallest particle of an element. So some examples of elements are, um, some of them are solids at room temperature, such as gold and carbon. There are many others as well. There are also gases at room temperature, such as hydro or oxygen and hydrogen. There are other gases at room temperature also. This one has a star by it. The only two elements that are liquids at room temperature are mercury and bromine. We represent these elements with symbols, which we will need to memorize. Compounds, then, is when, that's when I'm going to combine two elements, and I'm going to do that chemically, meaning I'm not just putting them next to each other. They are participating in a chemical reaction to make a new substance or a compound. So some examples are H2O, you know, is water. So to make water, I put... H, which is hydrogen, together with O, which is oxygen, to make water. Well, when hydrogen and oxygen are by themselves, we know that they are colorless, uh, odorless gases. But when I put them together with two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atoms, atom, I make water, which is a liquid. So these parts have specific characteristics but when I combine them chemically into a compound, that ends up having new characteristics or new properties. The same is true for NaCl, which is sodium chloride. Sodium by itself is a silvery white metal. Chlorine by itself is a yellow green gas. If I combine them chemically, they create sodium chloride, NaCl. And that is just table salt. It's what we put on our food. So again, by themselves, they have specific properties, but when put together, they have new properties that they did not have before. Um, these are only made of one type of molecule. So a molecule is the smallest part of a compound. 
while an atom was the smallest particle of an element. On the other side of that chart, I had mixtures. So this is when I combine my pure substances. So I either put an element and a compound together in the same jar, or I put two compounds together in the same jar. Um, so those are combined physically. They're not participating in a chemical reaction together. They're just sort of next to each other. Um, so the composition is not fixed. So I don't always have the same amount of salt in salt water, for example. And it's not uh, uniform either. The components this time are going to retain some of their properties. So when I put salt and water together, they have some of the same properties. The salt still tastes like salt. The water is still a liquid, for example. Where with our compounds, when we put them together, they had new properties because they were now in a compound. We have two types of mixtures. We have heterogeneous mixtures and homogeneous mixtures. The prefix hetero means different. So when I have a heterogeneous mixture, that means that the parts are noticeably different. I can tell that there are more than, there's more than one ingredient in that mixture. So an example of that is like a granola bar. So you see the peanuts, you see the chocolate chips, you see the peanut butter, whatever sort of granola bar you have, you can see all of the individual parts. Where with a homogeneous mixture, the prefix homo means same. So it all looks the same throughout. It looks like there's one substance there when really there's more than one substance there. So an example of that would be like your uh, water in a pool. The water there is not pure water. It has all kinds of chemicals in it to make sure that the water is safe for you to swim in. Um, but you can't see those uh, chemicals. So it all looks like there's one thing when really there is more than one thing. So that's what makes pool water a homogeneous mixture. There are different types of mixtures within homogeneous and heterogeneous mixtures. So a suspension is a mixture that is going to end up separating over time. So that means that I can shake it up and at first it looks cloudy. So think about like mud in water. So I shake it up and it looks cloudy and over time that mud is going to fall to the bottom. So that means that that's what we mean by separates over time. That means that this is definitely a heterogeneous mixture. If things are separating, that means I can see the different parts. That's what makes it heterogeneous. So the big particles fall to the bottom, and objects that say shake well before using are good examples of suspensions. So like orange juice, how the pulp falls to the bottom. We want to make sure that we shake that before we drink it um, so that it's all mixed together. Uh, these are going to appear cloudy, which we also say that cloudy things scatter light. So I cannot see clearly through a suspension. And I can filter these. So I can use like a strainer, for example, to collect that pulp and let the bigger parts get caught in the filter and the smaller parts come through. On the opposite end of the spectrum here, I have solutions. Solutions are going to basically be the opposite of a suspension. So what I have in a solution is I have a solute dissolving in a solvent. The solute is whatever you are dissolving, and the solvent is what does the dissolving. So let's say that I'm making Kool-Aid, for example, and I put my Kool-Aid uh, powder that has the sugar in it already, and I'm going to put that into the water. Well, the Kool-Aid powder is what is being dissolved. So that would be the solute. The solvent would be the water because that's what's doing the dissolving. Um, this is a homogeneous mixture because at the end I can't see the individual um, sugar particles anymore, for example, because they've dissolved. Um, speaking of water being a solvent, water is what we call the universal solvent, which means that it dissolves a lot of things. It dissolves more things than any other solvent that we have. The particles that I have in a solution are very small, and they're so small, small that they don't scatter light, which means they're not cloudy. I can see right through them. 
um, and they're too small to settle out. So once I dissolve that sugar, if as long as I didn't put too much sugar in, then the sugar is not going to fall to the bottom. It's going to stay suspended in the water. Um, if I increase the temperature of my solvent, so if I increase the temperature of the water, that means that I could put more solute in there. That means I could add even more Kool-Aid powder to make it even more sugary. Um, and then and a specific example of a solution is an alloy, which is a solution of solids. So usually this is for metals. I melt metals down and I mix them together and then I let them cool. So things like brass or steel, uh, sterling silver, those are all alloys, which are examples of solutions. I've already mentioned to you one way that I can separate a mixture, <clears throat> and that's by filtration. So that's when I use the size of the particles to separate them. So if I use a colander to collect the noodles and let the water come through, that's using filtration. I can also use distillation, which is when I separate a mixture using their boiling points. So if I have salt water, okay, so I have the water and I add some salt and I mix it together and it's all dissolved and I want to get the water and the salt separated again. If I look at their boiling points, water has a boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius. We know that. Salt has a boiling point of 1,465 degrees Celsius. That's huge. So if I bring that salt water to a boil, the water will end up boiling off and evaporating, and I will be left with the salt because it hasn't been able to evaporate yet. It takes a much higher temperature. It hasn't been, even been able to melt yet because that's an extremely high temperature compared to the temperature it takes to boil the water.